in your own life. Recall with me that there's a very important passage that connects with your own anxieties of the today, the yesterdays, and the tomorrows. I'm reading for you in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Verse 2, the Lord says to Abraham, Take your son, your only son, the son you love, to the region of Moriah to sacrifice him. And verse 3 says, Early in the morning. What is it that transpired between the closure of verse 2 and the commencement of verse 3? It was the length of a whole long night. Now I want to argue that for Abraham that was the longest night in his memory of agonies. It's morning if there's a parent of a teenager who's waited to the early morning hours when your child has still not come back. If there's a spouse here who's had a partner who's been giving all kinds of excuses for the late night, you know the anguish of the long night. If there's been somebody who stood outside an intensive care unit and was waiting for some positive report, the long night has troubled you. As you look at Abraham, it's probably his longest night as he's contemplating the call of God and what he must do with it. You find the king of Babylon was troubled when his friend Daniel was put into the lion's den. He had a sleepless night. How much more the father of a teenage boy? Tonight, as you look at the new day that's coming, as you look at this beautiful morning that's coming by, God's saying to you, Matthew 27, 57 is followed by Matthew 28, 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There is a dawn that comes. In the night, the shadows seem the longest. The enemy seems the strongest. The doubts seem like you can never get past them. But the morning will always come. And even as you think about one character from the New Testament, a man who saw his daughter struggling through a night, the anxiety of the morning unfolded as her blood pressure was coming down, as life signs were going away, and this ruler of the synagogue rushed to that one man he knew was the resurrection and the life and said, do something for my daughter, she's dying. And Jesus came to that home where the little girl was dead, puts her back into the father and mother's hand. She's alive, she's alive, she's alive. That Good Friday, Jairus looks at the cross of Jesus and he's probably saying, O oh Lord, the night is coming. But you who dispelled the darkness of my night, will this night hold you forever? The second truth, when the wrong seems too strong, tomorrow always comes. When the wrong seems too strong, tomorrow always comes. Please read with me. At Matthew 27 and verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and seal the body, steal the body, and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Have you ever experienced wrong that seems so strong? That Good Friday time, they put him to the cross, they put him into a tomb, and then they're saying, we want to rewrite history now. We want to take what can be true, and we want to transact it into falsehood. As you look around the globe, 
you find very, very many times the sounds of the soldiers, the sounds of the coins that are falling from Judas's hand, the sound of the water that Pilate is washing his hands away with, the sounds of a shifting crowd, all oh, the sounds that you're listening to as the hammer strikes the nail. All those sounds seem to somewhere drown the voice of the truth as it were. And yet you must remember this morning that history proves to us that truth is not a principle. Truth is a person. For a moment it seemed that the Roman heel of steel had dictated its final verdict on Jesus. As you look at truth, as you look at the lies that surround this moment, please carefully think about the words of the hymn writer. He wrote these powerful words, though the cause of evil prosper, yet the truth alone is strong, though her portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. As you walk through history's timeline, and you stand at the memories of what happened in one of what the most civilized parts of the world as they claimed it to be, the gas chambers that Hitler made. As you walk through memories of Auschwitz, as you walk through the pain and the turbulence that the young people presented to you in suicide bombers, in life that was broken in a moment by an unjust violence where innocent people's lives were snatched away because someone said, I'll press the button on a bomb. As you look at a world like this, as someone even today here in your workplace, in your family life, in your personal journey, you feel the injustice coming out at you and you're saying, where, oh God, is the truth? Where, oh God, is the right? There was a message that was coming to us from the words they sang. They said to us, the choice has to be made. The choice between that which is right and that which is wrong. And this morning as you think about it, evil seems strong for a moment. But please remember that when the wrong seems so strong, tomorrow always comes. The resurrection is a promise to us that tomorrow will come for people of the cross. We look at evil and we say, I'm still on the redemption side. Which side are you on this morning? I want to ask you a very personal question. Which side of the truth are you on this morning? Do you know for sure in your heart a truth is a person? Have you connected with him? Have you opened the doors of your heart to him? Does he really hold sway on your everyday moments, in all your relationships, in all the pursuits of your life, in your quest for excellence, in your look at destiny? Do you have him clearly, crystally in your heart? If he is, and you can triumph over evil with the good of his kingdom. There was a moment during the world war time when in a communist nation, a man was caught by a team of people for a very small error. And the man commanding that group of soldiers said, let's put this man to death. Someone said, sir, he's the father. He's the father of young children and the husband of a, of a young wife. He said, who else is in the home? They brought the elder boy of the father. And right before the father's eyes, they shot the son. Much later, the man who had commanded that incident was, was, was put in a trial and he was condemned. The father, whose son was killed by this man's command, walked up to the UN forces who were in charge of that moment and said, Give me access to that man. Please don't kill him. Please give him to me. And his wish was granted. History tells us that this man poured the love of Christ into that offender and that man became a pastor for the church of Christ. You know, when you look at evil, please remember, tomorrow will always come. And this morning, you may be sitting and saying, God, in my own relationships, in my own journey, I feel like people have thrown mud at my face. I feel like they've turned the truth into a lie. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, your tomorrow 
will shine like the star as it arrives. As a third truth, and I'm true. When the grave seems to have won, tomorrow always comes. When the grave seems to have won, tomorrow always comes. You know, Nihal was a little boy when we were walking away from Hosur Cemetery from a burial, from a funeral. And he asked me this very difficult question that you as a parent have faced too, from your little boy or little girl. He said, Dada, you said that that uncle who died has gone to heaven. But then why did you put him in a box and put him into the earth? Somewhere the logic doesn't seem to fit. As you look at 